<laughs> All right. Thank you very much for the invitation, Krishna. It's a real pleasure to be in here to, to share some of the knowledge that uh, we have obtained and developed in the last uh, few, so many years, at least 20 years. And uh, as you said, uh, the concept today will be to, to give some information regarding uh, the use and the production and use of sustainable binders for the use in, in soil stabilization. Uh, I will start here uh, with some example, examples of wastes that we have here in Brazil and that probably you can find most of the places in the world. For example, domestic agriculture, industrial and construction wastes are quite common. These that I'm, I'm gonna show it right now, such as uh, lime sources that can be obtained through eggshell or this is a, a, a kind of a domestic waste, or then we can also obtain uh, some of it as some of this lime as a waste from carbide lime, which is made from the production of, of uh, acetylene gas. We also have from, uh, these are, as I said, the sources from, from lime. We also have uh, sources from amorphous silica and alumina, and uh, from, in this case, in the first case, from agriculture, sugar cane bagasse and, uh, and its S, ash in this case, and also rice husk and rice husk ash are quite common here in, in Brazil, besides of other ashes from agricultural products too. And uh, we have also some uh, domestic waste that I could call like uh, glass waste. It's quite common here in Brazil. And also, this is some other material like plastic bottles that we can obtain fibers, not directly, uh, in, in, inserted as binders, but then can also uh, improve the behavior of the soil, as I'm going to show you later. Uh, and finally, we also have everywhere in, in the world the, the possibility of using construction wastes. And in this case that I'm showing this picture here, uh, the ground ceramic tile proce uh, preparation process from the tile and the residue up to this uh, fine content of it that we can get after grounding it, having grinding it. Okay. Uh, well, I would start just showing a, an expression regarding sustainability and in this case attitudes such as the re reuse of waste in the present case for the development of sustainable binders used for geomaterials stabilization uh, provide alternatives for the. Uh, the exploitation of natural resources. So the use of these residues, you can use less natural resources. So th this is the first approach that uh, is quite interesting. Uh, in addition to it, the use of these re re residues, uh, they play an important role because you can re reduce the price of, of, the, of the cost of the, the material using these this kind of residues instead of using, for example, Portland cement or using lime that would certainly be more harmful to, to the environment. So I will start here with some uh, study that we have uh, carried out in the last few years, and it is even uh, published. You can see in, in all, in all the, the slides here, you're going to have some kind of citation of the paper that is linked to it so you can find it easily. And in this case, it's a paper that was published now in 2020 by myself and some of my co-authors from my university regarding eggshell produced limes, produ produced limes uh, from both, both uh, quick lime production and adding water to it. And so you allow the hydration of it, you can also have hydrated line, both coming from eggshell, from burning eggshell. And, and so, so it's interesting to see here the photo uh, microscopy that you have, have here, the, the shape that you have when you have the quick line, or here in, in this shape that you have here when you have the hydrated line that is more pure than the commercial lines that at least we have here in, in Brazil. So it's quite interesting to, to see this kind of stuff. So you can produce a quite good line 
product from eggshell. And uh, we, we have also carried out a, a very basic study regarding the environmental performance of this eggshell uh, towards alternative, uh, as seen as an alternative lime and compare it to conventional limes. And in this case, environmentally looking at it from uh, life cycle analysis, the study has been done with the transportation, let's say, of the material from some kilometers from 100 kilometers to 250 kilometers to show in these four important uh, situations, let's say that you see for human health, ecosystem quality, climate change or resources, uh, a comparison of eggshell quick lime with a conventional quick lime that is produced in, in industry. And we see that the, the difference that we have here is regarding the ecosystem quality. Why? Because for the eggshell production, you do not involve querying of limestone and limestone improvement. You get the, the material uh, directly after the, its use, let's say, from, from a dom as a domestic waste. So that's the, the big uh, difference that we have in this situation looking at, at it now, the ecosystem quality. This uh, is being evaluated for publication and this by my co-authors and myself here in construction and building materials. Here I would like to, to call your attention for, for this patent that we have uh, obtained very recently of a new binder that is a, a combine a composite of quick lime or I, and in this case, or hydrated lime from eggshell uh, with ground glass. So it is, has been also published in 2019. And you see here uh, right below at the Journal of Materials and Civil Engineering with my co-authors too. And we see here uh, the amorphous shape that you have from the ground glass, or ground uh, waste, waste glass, uh, you have here the situation in which after seven days, if you put the ground uh, waste glass with, the, with carbide line or eggshell line, it's, it's the same situation that we would have here. And you have seen just the Portlandite being shown here. And after 28 days, you have seen for the first time Tobermorich, which is a mineral that also is produced uh, in Portland cement. When you have the hydration of the Portland cement, you have this kind of mineral that is produced. So it's due to that, that you have the strength and the stiffness of, of it. Continuing that, uh, it's interesting that it's a very, a very, uh, a very interesting study that we have been developing lately. And this lately is really in, in the last two years regarding the, the aspect of, uh, alkali activated kind of stuff. So in this, in this case here, I'd like to, 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 to show that we have a comparison here of uh, strength when you, you mix just the, the ground glass with carbide lime, uh, with different amounts of carbide lime you have here, five, for 5%, five you can get after seven days, uh, are the result, let's say, up to more than five megapascal, then more than six megapascal with 8% of carbide line, or even seven megapascal with 11% of carbide line. However, if you add a sodium hydroxide, NaOH in this case here, and uh, you leave the same same amount of time, three molal of this. So the activation solution concentration is three molal when you put this alkali activation of NaOH, you get after seven days, a quite higher strength. So it's interesting to see how you can even improve the use of these residues. So the ground glass and carbide line, if you add small amounts of sodium hydroxide here, you can more than double in this for the same very short period of time, seven days, the, the strength reaching with the 
minimum amount of line here about 13 megapascal and with the maximum amount of line that we have used here uh, almost reaching 16 megapascal from five to seven you almost or you double it certainly or even more so it's quite an interesting new approach that we are carrying out with this uh, alka activated uh, ground waste less and carbide line blends so this is a cement that we can see and can be used for uh, geotechnical purpose so this is also was just recently uh, published here at uh, journal of materials in civil engineering now in 2021 okay another interesting stuff is once again with the, the same uh, material so the the ground glass and carbide line or eggshell line we can use both both are residues let's say uh, we can see here a correlation between the unconfined compressive strength of a sand uh, with this carbide line and the ground glass versus the unconfined compressive strength versus the initial shear modulus that you might have you see here for different dry unitates, different amounts of ground glass and different amounts of this carbide line, we can see a relation of the unconfined compressive strength versus the initial shear modulus for uh, uniform sand. And here for another material, Botucatur residual sandstone is a residual soil that also for longer period of time, here is just seven days, here is 180 days but you have in both uh, this correlation occurring and you can guess that you have a, a distinct correlation between initial shear modulus and unconfined compressive strength so this is also published at the journal of geotechnica and environmental engineering a, a, a publication from 2018 that you're gonna listen to some other results later on in this presentation too so another quite interesting stuff is that uh, we have been producing in the lab this study but then we decided to go to the field and improve in layers in the from the field of such uh, sandy soils with this product with these residues with the ground glass and the carbide line so we have done plenty of studies uh, in the field where we improve these layers let's see that we have in in here and then we load them with uh, small footings that are made of of steel with different diameters and different thickness too and we see that when we do this kind of loading we have different failure mechanisms but these failure mechanisms they just to show that uh, they show up to be in some ways that you do not fail depending in the geometry of the of this layer you do not fail the layer and but you fail the soil or in other cases you fail the layer depending on the size but this happened using portland cement or using this uh sustainable binder so it works perfectly in the field as we expected so these results you can find details of it also at the journal of geotechnica and environmental engineering from uh, last year, from November of 2020, uh, you have this spread footings on green stabilized sand uh, over layers of weakly bonded residual soil. Is that, I think that's a quite interesting stuff that you could take a look at when possible. So at this moment, I want to show you uh, some results of soil improvement using binders and also fiber reinforcement. The fiber reinforcement, as I said, I told you before, is the idea of having uh, plastic bottles turn into fibers. Uh, and then we can see uh, the results. But before of that, in this case, just showing some triaxial testing at uh, uh, confining stresses of 20 kilopascal, just small ones, we can see the stress strain strength, let's say, of just a, a given soil here that we have here. If you just add, for example, 25% of fly ash, you don't change so much the, the behavior, just the fly ash, because it's, it's, this is class F fly ash without lime on it. And if you just put this soil 4% of carbide lime, which is also residue, you have a very nice, interesting 
stiffness increase and also the strength more than double. But the real situation that happened, and this is a paper that was published in Journal of Geotechnical and Environmental Engineering in 2001, so 20 years ago, that when you have the fly ash and the carbide line, so you have here the amorphous phase of silica and alumina, and here you have the alkali, uh, strong alkali material here, you have a pozzolanic reaction that after, in this case, uh, 28 days for all the results, you have something that is quite stiffer and stronger than just the, the, the lime and much more, of course, than just adding the soil or just putting the fly ash, okay? So, and this fly ash, as I said, it's class F, which doesn't have lime on it. So when you add lime, you have something much stiffer, much stronger, but you have a problem here that it, after you get the failure of a very small axial strength, uh, you have a loss of strength, which is quite high. So the, this, this index that, uh, let's say, you have this in reducing the, 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 the strength after peak is a problem also. And you might resolve or solve this problem uh, through the addition of fibers. First, just let me show you what happened. Here you have some plastic fibers. Uh, mixed with, with sand. And here we have the study of it with four different confining stresses. Just show that you have something like if you have just the soil uh, without any fiber or anything else or any cement on it, you have a elastic, almost perfectly plastic kind of behavior. However, when you add in this case 0.5% of a fiber that is very thin, uh, you have this elastic strain hardening kind of behavior, which is not common in normal soils, let's say, but uh, you might have in soils with roots and so, but the roots may uh, deteriorate in time and not that's not going to happen with this, this plastic. So you have this very interesting kind of behavior with a strain hardening to high axial strains in this case here. You can find uh, this study in a paper from uh, Geosynthetics International from 2009, as you, you see here. But if you add a kind of cement and, uh, and also the fiber, you are going to see something like, and I'm going to call attention for this figure, this picture here. If you have just adding some, uh, uh, some cement, you have a peak and then you fail in here. Okay. So, but if you add, the size of the cement, amount of cement, in this case is 4% of cement, 0.5% of plastic fiber, you have something that is stronger and have a ductile behavior here, which is quite important in this case. So this works for uh, average amounts of cement, cement tissues binder, let's say any binder that you put in this case, 4%. If you put less, less 1%, it also works as a strain hardening kind of material, as if you, you have seen before with zero cement, with 1% of cement, you have a very nice improvement. With 4% of cement also, with 7% of cement, you also have this kind of improvement with a ductile behavior. Besides of increase in strain, you have a ductile behavior, but, with, but for very high amounts of cement, it doesn't not, not work anymore, not perfectly at least. It, it, uh, it turns the, the, the behavior less brittle, let's say, because the brittleness here is huge. Let's say for 10% of cement, you get a peak and then quite brittle behavior. But if you add fiber, you do not get any more a ductile behavior. It's less brittle, of course, but it's not ductile for very high amounts of cement, in this case, 10%. But you see that for average amounts of cement up to five or even seven percent it depends on, on the soil and, and the, the time that, that you are saying this is just for seven days of curing you have this kind of improvement that is quite interesting so this was published in geotextiles and membranes uh, in 2009 another thing that is quite important for brazil in the last year last years let's say last uh, about 10 years we have had the, the failures of two huge uh, tailings dams here in Brazil. And uh, we have been studying the possibility of, of why did that uh, fail 
and the static liquefaction study is one of the possibilities. And so we have studied, uh, in this case, gold tailings without any kind of improvement with the void ratio that they have in the field and so, which is about 1.2, the void ratio. And we have seen here through undrained triaxial testing that you get it the, for very small confining stress, 25 and up to 50 here, you get the static liquefaction. So the, the effective stress go to zero. And so it fails. And we see here, this result, the stress strain results here going coming to zero here. And uh, the increase of post positive pore pressure here, mainly that we have, we have seen here, these values that for small confining stresses, they take it to zero, the, the effective stresses. And for larger ones, it does not, uh, it even reduces the, the, the strength due to, we see here the stress path, but does not reach the failure. So a way that uh, due to this, we believe we have had these two failures in Brazil, Fundão and Brumadinho, which happened in 2015 and 2019. In the second one here, more than 300 people died due to this failure. And in the first one in Fundão, about 20 people died. But uh, right now, this became a very important issue here in Brazil because the mining uh, industry is quite important for Brazil gross internal product. And let's say, and uh, so this, this situation has to be solved. We are uh, involved in, uh, in the development of solutions for this. And one of the things that we are looking at is the insertion of small amounts of cement in this material in, in the field, keeping the, the same void ratio, let's say, which is quite high. And uh, we are looking at, in this case here, for example, adding 75 kilos of Portland cement, or could be, of course, when, when, we, when we talk here cement, I even might have used in some cases Portland cement, or even I use lime, for example, but we could certainly change it to sustainable binders and the results would be exactly the same. So the, the idea is the solution of the problem using binders, but even in the case as this one that we have used Portland cement at that moment, nowadays we are moving completely to, to the study using uh, sustainable uh, binders to, to solve the same problem. And in this case here, when you add small amounts of, of this cement, you have a completely different stress path, even maintaining the, the, the same confining stress and so, so 25, 50, and 75, but looking at one of them, you have a, a production in this case of negative pore pressure that we can see here. And uh, it turns the, the, the tailings completely uh, without any possibility of having liquefaction and more than that, it's quite strong. And so we, I can show you the, the concept here is still a concept we have not used, but the concept has been developed is like say to, to make uh, the ground improvement right below the this upstream tiling dams that exist already in Brazil. We have about 800 of these dams in Brazil that were already built and they are under situation the possibility of failure. Uh, and so this kind of idea of using deep mixing with sustainable binders, and so you can change completely the, the possibility of having failure does not have occur anymore. And so this is a study that we are carrying out for mitigation of liquefaction potential, uh, increasing stability, and even if some problem of flow occur, you can have the flow control due to that. Another problem that we have here in South America, we have in Brazil, we have in Bolivia, we have in Argentina, we have in Paraguay. And this study was carried out in Paraguay uh, from by myself and some of my students that are from, from this country, which is right localized right beside Brazil. Uh, this is a newspaper from Paraguay showing a, a problem that uh, makes uh, reduces the possibility of uh, economic uh, grow of Paraguay, which is 
a part of the country, which is about 60% of the land that they have, they, they have problems towards bringing the, all, all, the, all the sources of uh, income that they could have to bring it to places where they can export it, for example, due to the road. So here, uh, this is the, the real headlines of the newspaper in Spanish. And here in, in a, a free translation to English would be impassable road, eternal problem in the Paraguayan Chaco. I can show you here, for example, this is Paraguay, Brazil is right beside here. And this region of Paraguay, this whole region, which is about 60% of Paraguay, they have plenty of dispersive soils, which are soils that have high contents of sodium, and they are quite erodible, as you can see here. So just with some rain and so you have this kind of erodibility. And besides of having this sodium, and so you have sulfates also in some regions. So in this region here is basically uh, this dispersive soil and more to the north, it's dispersive and also sulfated soil. So these materials are really terrible and in a situation that we, we have, the, the usual way of solving it is not using the soil for the pavement and uh, replacing it by granular materials and so, but they don't have, do not have stones or granular materials nearby, at least in 300 to 400 kilometers from, the, from this region where the problems occur. So the necessity of improving this soil that have these conditions here is imperious for the, their grow, economic growth of Paraguay because they produce lots of groceries and other stuff in, in this region and they have to bring to the assumption, uh, assumption and so to in order to, to export or even for, for them to, 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 to consume. And so we have turned some studies in, into it. There is another paper here, uh, the effect of coal fly ash and also mellowing uh, in reducing or avoiding the problems of sulfate rich dispersive clay after using a lime stabilization and this lime could be produced in a sustainable way, of course. Here we see what happened to the roads in Paraguay, okay, uh, due to this soil that we have at these two soils. So this happened less than six months after these roads bases or sub bases are built. So you can imagine that uh, the amount of money that is dispended and the solution does not occur. So it's a huge problem for, for Paraguay and we are dealing with it and we already have seen solutions using some sustainable binders. And one thing that is important regarding these sustainable binders for them to be economically pos possible to be used, you have to use the wastes that you have nearby where you are building it in order that the transportation is not going to be uh, something that is going to increase so much the, the price of the, the construction of the road, for example. So we are using uh, wastes that are nearby, you have produced nearby where it happened in Western Paraguay in this study. And this was published in this case at Canadian Geotechnical Journal now in 2020, last year so. Here in this same paper, uh, we have looked at uh, a study, for example, in, in the field, we have done in the field some tests with layers that were built. And so we have studied the number of passes and the field density, and we have produced, in this case specifically, uh, experimental uh, road section scheme where we change the amounts of lime that we are using and the dry unit weight also, three dry unit weight. So we have done these nine uh, sections, different sections with different dry unit weights and, and uh, let's say these three dry unit weights and these three amounts of lime. And we have measured in the field the, the deflections through this uh, lightweight deflectometer here that we use in, in all the sections. And we can see here what happened uh, in the field. We see, for example, that where you, you, we use the smaller dry unit weight, the amount of lime is, if you, we use four, six, or eight, uh, the deflections do not change and they are large, even after 28 days of curing, which is this case here, this is for, 
uh, one day and then it is reducing but reduces up to this point. On the other side, when we use the, the, the densest material, so the largest dry unit weight, we already have uh, very small deflections that were measured, but they also do not change uh, with the amount of lime, at least for this period of time that we have studied, which is 28 days of curing. So it's quite interesting uh, to see the effect in this case of both the dry unit weight and also the amount of the, the binder that in this case is lime uh, in measuring the deflections that we have. This, as I said, it was published in the Canadian Geotechnical Journal last year. Another view of possible using of sustainable binders is for the pulling out or the uplift, let's say, of uh, footings that you might have. You, you, you dig a, a hole here uh, and then you can put the shallow footing and then you have to backfill it. So we have studied in a centrifuge study for the period that I have had, I have been in uh, at University of Western Australia for a year in 2006, uh, we have carried out some centrifuge testing uh, to show how it does work if you, you put zero, just a sand as a backfill, or if, you, or if you start putting, adding some small amounts of cement from one to 5%. And here we see the pulling out, the uplift of, let's say the pulling out load, or in this case, divided by the, the diameter of the, of the shallow footing, the maximum stress that you can hold. And in this case, just for the sand, you get 50. If you put in this material that is backfilled in this region here, 1% uh, of cement, you double the, 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 the load or the stress that you might held. And if you put 3%, you might uh, get to more than twice the, the, the value up to 160 or so. And that if you put 5% of this binder, you get to 250. So it's five times, you can reach five times the uplift load the, the, that you the pull out load that you might have if you just do the backfill with the sand. Putting some cement on it, you can multiply by five the capacity of the upload that you, I mean, the, 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 the load for the tensile load that you can, the traction load that you can do in this case here. This was carried out, as I said, in a centrifuge testing. We have done, after a few years, when I came back, uh, a real situation in the field, in the real size. Uh, and then we have improved in the field. We have testing, so pulling out these anchors and so. And in this case here, the difference was that uh, we have deferred the depth in which these uh, plates were, were held. And we say here that, for example, in a case where is, uh, the depth is, let's say, one time the diameter of the, the plate, you get 22 kilonewtons. But if you do it twice this depth, you, get, you increase to almost 90 kilonewtons the, the value of the, the maximum load that you can have pulling out in these guys. So this was also published at the Journal of Geotechnical and Environmental Engineering. And it is another case uh, in which you might have the sustainable binders improving the characteristics of the soil, the situation, and you can solve geotechnical and environmental problems using these sustainable binders. Here is another paper that was published in 2019 also at the Journal of Geotechnical and Environmental Engineering, showing that the mechanisms of failure that you might have for a, a compression load of a, a shallow footing, if you improve the top of, uh, of the soil with a layer with cement, if it's very thin, this layer, you might have a, a, a given shape of the failure. If it's thicker in this case, you have another failure mechanism. And we can, we have proved how it occurs through numerical modeling. In this case, you the finite element method with some basic constitutive modeling, uh, in which places you have the, the surge of uh, tensile stresses. And we have proved that this kind of failure that occur in these very stiff cemented soils, they start, the starting point is at the places where you have the highest value of tensile stresses. In very thin layers, it starts right here at the perimeter of the, 
of the plate right below of it and which is this case here in this situation but in here where you have a thicker layer the related to the diameter in this case you have the higher uh, tensile stresses occurring exactly in the middle in this case in the middle of the plate this is the half of the plate that we're looking and at the bottom of bottom of the improved layer so it's very interesting to see that uh, we have been able to to promote a solution a, numer a numerical and then analytical solution in the end and you can see it through this paper that is in here so but at this moment i would like to 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 call your attention for something that i i think that is really interesting and it was an addition to the knowledge that has started in 2007 with an index that we have introduced to literature we call it porosity binder index when you use like portland cement you can even put the c as a portland cement if it's lime you put l but this is if it is a, a, a another kind of binder that is a production of some wastes and, and so you can use a b from binder and the iv here is just to to to, to show uh, something like uh, different because it's volumetric. If you use CV, it would be something with consolidation. So we put an I in front of it uh, in order to show this another parameter that doesn't have anything to do with consolidation. But this parameter here, uh, we started to, to look at it and to understand that it would like uh, control the behavior of cemented soils. And the first publication of it was in 2007, and this is the, the publication also at the Journal of Geotechnical and Environmental Engineering. I would call attention for the number of citations that we have nowadays, uh, almost 260 at Scopus and 230 at uh, Web of Science. And uh, as I said, we started looking at uh, a rational methodology that considered both the porosity and the, the amount of cement. And we can show by the how what means each one of the what is porosity with the this uh, volumetric cement content here that you cut the, the verse. So it's the same thing, the volume of voids and divided by volume of cement. But we prefer to use uh, without any uh, any kind of uh, system of unity let's say without unity is, is better to to introduce it and so <clears throat> let me show you here if we have compacted some soil with cement let's say we have molded specimens in with a, in this case with a unique uh, moisture content and different dry unit weights a1 2 3 and 4 and also we have molded with a unique dry unit weight and different moisture contents in this case. But let's look first for this one here, where you have a unique moisture content and different dry unit weights. We have here the results, the, the unconfined compressive strain versus just porosity. And we see something that's quite usual. If you increase porosity, you reduce the strength. But this is the result for 1% of cement. And this is the result for 7% of cement. So these results here are, for example, for this dry unit weight that we have in here and with results of cement from one to seven. If we get all these results and also the results for the different moisture contents, if we put TU, which is a confined compressive strain versus eta CIV, and we have to elevate to a, a exponent here, and then we are going to explain it later. But in order to have uh, the same uh, influence of porosity and amount of cement, in here, in some cases, we have to add an exponent that is smaller than zero. This is for fine grain soils. If you have a, a fine soil, uh, sorry, if you have a grain soils, uh, it could be near nearly one in this case. Okay, but <clears throat> what is interesting is that all these results with different dry unit weights and different amount of cement and different moisture moisture contents in this case they show to be set in a unique equation that is a power equation, as we can see here, with a very high uh, coefficient of determination, as we see here. At this moment, we have studied uh, in lab tests and so, but then 
in a in a agreement with University of Bristol, in which I have also carried out part of uh, one of my sabbatical licenses. Uh, I've been working with uh, Dr. Andrea Diambra and Professor Erdin Ibrahim and some of my colleagues from my university too. And we have developed a theoretical derivation for why we have uh, the unconfined compressive strength function of porosity and this volumetric cement content, showing that here you have a scalar in front of it. And this other scalar here, it appears in these two. So these are connected. So you might have 0 0.28, and here you have 3.6 or so. Or you have 1 here, and here is nearly 1, 2. So for sands, this value of A is about 1. For fine grain soils, this value of A is about 3. Point something, 3.6 or so. Uh, so we have based all this study, and it's published also in Journal of Geotechnical and Environmental Engineering in 2017, 10 years after we have developed the, the concept in the lab, we have been able to explain it. And you can see all, all the theory in this paper. I'm not going to, to, to go on, but you can read the paper to, to understand this later. So up to that moment, we have developed uh, uh, an index that was able to control through the variation of porosity and the variation of the amount of cement, the unconfined compressive strength. Later on in 2010, we could expand that for splitting tensile strength for flexural, flexural tensile strength too, that uh, we have another cure, for example, that have the same shape for unconfined compressive strength of splitting tensile strength. We have similar shapes of the equations. So if you divide the varying the dry unit weights and vary the amounts of cement, you have a unique cure for unconfined compression and unique cure for splitting tensile. And they are showing here. They are both, as you see, a function of eta CIV elevated to an exponent, which is similar to both. So you can cut this. And it shows that for each kind of binder and each kind of soil, you have a unique relation that is a scalar. For example, this is Osorio sand with uh, early strain Portland cement in this case. And for this soil and this cement, doesn't matter the amount of cement that we have used and doesn't matter the density of it, the relation that you have between tensile strength and unconfined compressive strength is unique, is 0.15, which is also interesting. But we went further. We start changing the, the binders. For example, we use just lime for some soils. And we also were able to obtain something like this would be porosity divided by the uh, volumetric line content or the, just the volume as it's in here. And it also shows here, we have results from different amounts of line from three to 11% in this case, and also different dry unit weights. And we can see here that the results, once you put towards this variable, the result is a unique curve. And this was published with myself and some of my colleagues uh, at the Journal of Materials and Civil Engineering from ASC in 2009. Here are the results from a paper that I have already shown previously using the green stabilized sand, which means like carbide lime or actual uh, lime, hydrated lime with uh, ground glass in, in a sand that we have also unique results for this using lime for each amount of uh, ground glass that we have used. We have de not depending on the dry unit weight of the lime content, you have unique cures for several dry unit weights and several lime contents. And here, looking at one given period of curing in this case. Here, we have another thing which is quite interesting, already using a coal fly ash as uh, the, the source of silica and aluminum and amorphous uh, phase with also carbide line. And we show here something also interesting. We have the results of the carbide line and the, the ground, uh, sorry, and the, and the coal fly ash with the size that it comes from the term thermoelectrical power plant. And we have also varied the amounts of uh, lime, the carbide line, and the dry unit weight. But we get this unique cure for varying all this stuff with this kind of result. 
In this case here, when we add 1% of uh, sodium chloride with the, the, the usual salt that you use in, in cook for cooking and so, and for a given curing temperature, uh, it increases three times. We can see through this color, as this is the, the same, this in here, the only change here is this color in front of it. So the shape of the cube is the same. So you, we can see here that due to the introduction of this sodium chloride, it increases three times the strength, just due, just due to that. But there's another thing quite interesting. In this case, as I said, we got the, the coal fly ash directly from, from the thermoelectrical power plant. But before using, as we have done directly in here, we have uh, grinded it. So we reduced the size of the particles after two hours of uh, grinding. And in this case, what happened due to that and uh, also the result is compared. This result without any sodium chloride increases for 0 to 57 to 1.73. So it triples it due to the grinding. And uh, if you, besides of that, if you put 1% uh, of sodium chloride, it gets to almost six times this value, original value that we have here. So there's a, a mechanical which is due to the break of the, the grains and increasing the, the surface of the particles. It increases a lot the, the strength that you can get. And besides of it, if you put sodium chloride in small amounts, it also can increase, uh, surprisingly can increase chemically the, this strength. But the, at this moment, 2017, when we published at construction building materials this, we didn't know why, uh, why, what was happening in this chemical situation. So the, the, the sodium or the, the chloride or so would uh, connect to the particles or something. And then we had, we, we showed in 2019 that was not exactly that. That what occurs is that the sodium chloride, in this case, it enhances strength and durability also of the material in a short period of time. So it enhances it in a short period of time. But if you leave one year uh, before testing it, the results are not going to be different. They're going to be the same, for example. And so in a short period of time, seven days or so, it increases, as it shows here, a lot from uh, almost six times, the, in this case, the strength. But with curing time that we have here, after one year, the results are the same. So it is important to use a sodium chloride in this case for, for the, the characteristics that are important in the field so that I can get very high strength in a short period of time, for example, in seven days. So I can already use, if I am doing a, a base of a road, I can already cross with trucks on the top of it after seven days. What would not happen uh, if I didn't add, for example, the sodium uh, chloride in this case. And also the durability in a short period of time is, is doubled in this case, it's shown here. But after uh, half a year, uh, if you are going to test durability is almost the same. So it's important the sodium chloride for a short period of time to enhance not just strength, but also durability. This is accumulated loss of mass that we would have here. So this was also published in 2019 at Canadian Geotechnical Journal. Here, uh, once again, it's important to show that this parameter, this index that we're showing here, it does not control only unconfined compressive strength of split intensive strength, but also controls initial shear models or maximum shear model, G0, we would call here. Uh, here we have two different materials, one from Portugal and another from southern Brazil. We have tested with a similar cement with the early strain portland cement for seven days but different amounts of cement, different soils, and different dry unit weights. And uh, we have here, for example, from this poor to well-graded silty sand, we have here a unique curve, for example. And from Osorio sand treated of the same cement, we have another unique curve here. It's, it's interesting to show, and this was published at Geotechnique in 2012, that uh, this parameter here does not control only strength, but also stiffness. That's uh, an addition to it. Here is another, another further result 
and in which we carried out two different triaxial testing in which the volume of voids divided by volume of cement was the same. So this value, which is porosity divided by the volumetric cement content equal to 10, for example, both with a unique confining pressure, 400 kPa, but they were molded with different voids ratio. One is 0, 0, 0, 0.7, another 0 0.8, and different amounts of Portland cement. But when you put volume of voids divided by volume of cement, they are going to have the same result. And so we see that the stress strain curve is almost the same. So in this case, we can show that through these triaxial results, that based on a unique volume of voids or volume of cement, a unique confining stress, but test uh, samples or specimens that were molded with different confining uh, different uh, uh, void ratio and different amount of cement, we have a unique result if this index is the same, which is the case in here. So this was published in 2009 at Journal of Geotechnical and Environmental Engineering. So it says that this variable, oh, sorry, this parameter, this index, it controls also the triaxial behavior as it expected. Now in 2017, we went a little bit further, and I think that is quite important to show that, that uh, we have sand specimens with different shapes, different roughness. We can see our shapes are quite different. So some are from, uh, from uh, wastes also. This is, a, for example, this one is a product of uh, uh, agate polishment here. And this is a, uh, this is a source from a, uh, from a crushed basalt to have crushed rock and so on. And these are, this is the Osorio sand and this is the Porto Silti sand that we have. So we have published a journal of material in Sydney. Something that's quite interesting. These are the results for a, a given a given sand from agate with early strain Portland cement compression, um, confined compression with strength in seven days. We have here the influence of the initial voice ratio. This is the smaller voice ratio, we have this curve for uh, the highest voice ratio, we have this curve here and here, it increases according to the amount of cement. But it's interesting that if we tested the granitic sand or the Osorio sand using different Portland cement, PC3 early strength or the standard cement and doing carrying out tests with seven or 28 days compression or tensile strength, the shapes of the curves which are given through this here are exactly the same here for this sandy material. All our sands, even though they have different roughness, different shapes of the particles and so, but there is always sand. We have shown that the shape, so it means at the CIV elevated to an exponent here, the exponent is almost the same here. And the only thing that really changes is the scalar in front of it. So the scalar, is showing if it is uh, the result of a tensile test or a unconfined compressive test, or if you have different cements, or if you have different curing uh, times and so, but they all, all have a unique shape, let's say. And we normalize this, normalize all this, divided, uh, dividing the result, for example, for a given eta CIV, let's say I've chosen 20. I divide all the, the points of this green curve by the, at the value of eta CIV equal to 20. I do the same here. I get the, for eta CIV 20 for the red curve, I, I, I plot, I'm going to show you soon, all the results divided by this value that I have here. I do for all tests. When I do that, this normalization shows a unique curve. And as it expected, why is it expected? Because we have uh, uh, about the same and unique uh, power in the top of this. So the only thing that changes is this scalar. So the shape of the particle, the roughness of the particle, the origin of it, if, if it is a compressive or a tensile, and so all of this is inserted in this scalar in front of it, which is quite interesting. So in the end, sorry, I have for sandy or granular materials, let's say without fines, uh, I have this unique result and a unique curve in this normalized stuff. So in this sense, you're going to read it later in, the, in this paper, but you're going to understand what I'm going to say after you, you read it. 
plenty. But if you divide so each one of the points of each curve by the value of eta CIV for a given stuff, you get, as I show, a unique curve here. So QU divided by QU for eta CIV 20 is always, you're going to get this. It you know, doesn't matter the, the origin of the soil, if it's a sandy soil, granular soil, of course. And uh, if, if it's a, a Portland cement or a binder, a sustainable binder is always the same that you're going to have, doesn't matter. Also, the curing time, all these are going to be introduced, the differences in, in the scalar in front of the equation. When you have fine grain soils, we have another equation that is a little bit different. So we have this 0.28, which is here, and also this almost 3.6 or about that. So this is also a unique curve. And we have shown that for fine grain soils, so th those dispersive soils from Paraguay, London clay, some organic soils from southern Brazil, some uh, residual soils that we have also here in Brazil, some silty soils with different moisture contents and so on, all of them normalizing, they are shown a unique curve. So we have a curve for, in this case, fine grain soils and a unique curve for grain soils, for sandy soils. But in this case, it's interesting to, to see that. And here is just showing for a particular material. In this case, we have used gold tailings in which we added cement. If we have one result, we can substitute this result in here, for example, for uh, eta CAV 30, and we can already show up what is the curve. So this is the curve based in all, only one result. And these results that we have here were the orders that we got in the, in the, in the lab tests. So it fits perfectly, but only based in this result in the curve that we have before that works for all fine grain soils. We have shown that. And in here also, getting coal fly ash, which is also residual with cement, and just one result to draw the curve. And then we put the other results and see that they fit perfectly also. So it's quite interesting. This was published at Soils and Foundations in 2016. In here is just to show uh, a result that we have published at Canadian Geotechnical Journal in 2018, showing that we also can control through this index the accumulated loss of mass, as we see here, as a unique curve for a given uh, cement, a given soil. In this case, it's not a soil, it's a, a residue, it's a, a gold tailings. And in here, another, another thing, uh, uh, also the, we're using now sustainable binders for stabilized dispersive clays, which have like the sodium chloride, so they have a problem. But using, in this case, uh, ground glass and carbide lime, we are able to show, once again, the unconfined compressive strength cured for several dry unit weights and several amounts of this binder. And two different curing temperatures, this is for about 23 degrees, this is for 40 degrees. So we have curves specific for different curing temperatures too. It's interesting to show that in, in this place, in the field in Paraguay, in during the summer, you have the whole day about 40 degrees. So it's interesting to see in this case that you have much stronger material due to the curing temperature uh, for a, the, a unique period of time, which is seven days. And also here we have the, in this case, showing the accumulated loss of mass for one, three, or in the, in the, in, after 12 cycles, which is the ASTM standard shows to be, we have a unique curve with a shape which is almost unique. And as I said, was published this year at the Journal of Materials in Civil Engineering. Once again, that paper from 2018 with this uh, sustainable binder showing also that you have a unique result for accumulated loss of mass versus this index uh, porosity binder index that we have here. This is then confined compressive strain for two other soils, but for uh, if we use both soils here, the, the results are unique in here too for the durability. And in here uh, is just, I'm going to, to finish soon, but it's just to show that if we use different pozzolans, so different amorphous residues, let's say, which is in this case, ground glass, rice husk ash, bottom ash, all this we have in a normalized way unique results. And if once again, if I have one result of accumulated loss of mass for a given uh, index here, for example, I can set 
the curve based in this curve that was obtained for all other studies. So it shows that for these materials, it's always unique, this curve. And so having one point, I can draw the curves and these others here were carried out later and they show that fits perfectly the curve and it is unique for several materials. <clears throat> here is, uh, there are some other results. This was also published this year, Transportation Geotechnics, uh, showing also the, the unconfined compressive strength, initial shear modules for all the tests with different uh, residues, let's say, different curing temperatures, but it shows that normalization shows for unconfined compressive strength for initial shear modules, a unique curve in this case. Well, we could see it's enough. We already have several parameters that control strength, stiffness, durability. Well, it controls even more the swelling possibility here that we have. So it also controls the swell for expensive soils. So you have minerals like Mont Morionite or so. If you, uh, if you want to, you can control in this case using <coughs> line, in this case a sustainable line. We show also that you control through this index indistinctly of the amount of line and the dry unit that you have also a unique curve. So we went to the literature and we got results from several authors and we showed that <coughs> in the end normalizing, these are the res results without normaliz normalization, but are based on this index. But when you normalize, you get a unique curve too. So you can, with one result of expansion for a given soil and a given binder, a given dry unit weight also, you can have one point and with that one point, you can already know what's the behavior of different dry unit weights and different amounts of that cement for a given soil. So once again, <clears throat> was published with my, by myself and some colleagues uh, in 2020. Now in 2021, it's already, it's, it's already online, but it doesn't have the issue number or page and pages and so, but there is a result from myself and several of my co-authors here regarding also the use of a Portland cement or a binder, sustainable binder that would make a, 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 the same situation that if you use Portland cement, which is our case, let's say, to use sustainable binders, you are going to have the same situation or in which you also control the expansion using such a, a material. We have shown here through this paper that you already find it uh, through this uh, DOI here that you have you can find it in over there. We also have some studies uh, on uh, life cycle analysis, in this case, in an environmental view, from environmental viewpoint. So if you can get a given strength uh, through different amounts of binders and different densities, what would be more sustainable in regarding uh, environmental viewpoint? And we show here that the sustainability in this case for a given specific strength, you can a more sustainable results towards environmental situation uh, regarding global warming and embodied energy if you compact more to get a unique, a unique strength. Com compacting more, having smaller dry, uh, uh, smaller voice ratio, high dry unit weight, higher dry unit weights, you get a better result if you do that. So if you get a given strength, compacting more than adding more binders. So it's what is, has been shown and published at Journal of Cleaner Production 2017. Here is a, a paper that was published this year to a decision making model, not just regarding environmental impact, but also economic viewpoint. We have here, you can find the details here, how it was calculated, but we show where uh, it affects more. And we see that regarding cost, of course, uh, the line production uh, is the one that gets the mostly of the of the core the cost uh, in this case in some cases al al almost half of the cost that goes for transportation extraction and blending and so but the most of it regarding cost is through the use of lime as we can see here and uh, of course from environmental viewpoint also the the amount of lime is the one that causes more damage, let's say, towards carbon dioxide emission and other viewpoints from the environmental point. And here is just to show if I have chosen through this L, uh, index a given strength 
or a given cure in time, if I have any point that I choose in this curve, let's say in this case, I have chosen this one, we have shown here for the same eta LIV here, that the, what was the best solution for uh, environmental and economic viewpoints would be this, where it crosses, I mean, for this value, 32 something here, we have come and this is the solution that has the lesser impact for photochemical oxidation, for global warming, for embodied energy in terms of environmental viewpoint and regarding cost is also the same situation. So, which is interesting to, to show up here is that the, the, the solution that is better for ground improvement using binders, for example, the environmental one is also the solution that is, has the best price or the lowest cost too. So we have shown this, uh, this kind of situation. This I also put in here just to have uh, some of the papers that we have published in the last three years, the, more, the ones that are, let's say, most of them are related to sustainable binders. We have other papers, but these are the ones 